so what my name is Patty Sarcon and I'm just sharing uh, with you today my doctoral research that it's on 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 language books. I have to say that I'm very pleased to be here. It's the first time I participate in a, in an event of this network. So thanks Beck for inviting me and thanks also uh, to Rob for encouraging me to join this network. And well, you know, my my topic is language MOOCs, um, and I wanted to provide a plural perspective. So I think that you know, um, this thesis was prepared, um, was defended like a collection of published papers. So for me, it makes more sense to probably, you know, to share some of the most outstanding issues, but also some of the things about my my experience writing the thesis. So um, this is the um, this is the outline that I will be following today. So I would like to explain the motivations behind the selection of the topic and the perspective, also the rationale. And I also would like you to understand why uh, why I decided to study language MOOCs and not just MOOCs, right? This is a thing about uh, applied linguistics. And I would like you to, to understand, you know, the reasons why. I will also explain some essential literature that were based that was basically the, the base of um, the subsequent research that I decided uh, for the thesis. And, you know, instead of um, uh, explaining one, I um, mean, its publication, I mean, all the details about its publication, I would like to draw, you know, the main aims of the thesis, objectives, and the hypothesis. So for that, I think it would be interesting to share some of the uh, methodo uh, methodologies that I, I was working on, and also, uh, you know, the main, main conclusions of the thesis. So, um, well, you know that uh, normally when you, when you, hear about MOOCs, we talk, I mean, we, we know that they emerged um, as an alternative um, um, way of, of um, for, for open ed, for open education. So it has potentially, the, um, the, we had the potentially the opportunity, you know, to reach larger audiences, to democratize education, like in the case of OERs. But uh, we don't normally hear, um, you know, the language MOOCs. I mean, we don't, I mean, we normally talk about generalistic MOOCs. We, not, we talk about the structure of the courses or, you know, um, I don't know instructional design, participation, but we are not so specific about this, uh, this morality, right, or this discipline of language learning. And um, I think that well, the, um, we, 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 have, uh, we are now in a moment that language uh, learning in MOOCs has become a distinctive discipline, so something different. And I think it's mainly because of two reasons, right? So the first thing is, yet, um, if you think about it, I mean, everyone during their lifetime will engage in language learning at least two or three times. And, um, and this is something that if MOOCs have great potential to reach larger audiences, I think that language MOOCs especially have it have also, I mean, have more potential to do that because, you know, everyone is going, is, is likely to be engaged in language learning during their lifetime. So, and also we have different motivations, right, for learning a language. So um, if you think, especially for non-native uh, English speakers, we are required to uh, learn English for studying and also for working. But then there are other motivations like, I don't know, like, um, you can learn a language for traveling or you can learn a foreign language for, you know, getting to know other cultures. We have these great language MOOCs on minority languages, like the ones from Ireland or also here in Spain. So, yeah, um, as you can see, you know, we, we can we can we could reach uh, uh, larger audiences. And we have many, many different motivations. So I think that when MOOCs emerge, applied linguistics have a special interest in uh, in making this format work. But at the same time, we had a lot of different challenges because as you may know, uh, language learning is not just the pure transmission of knowledge, but we also need to develop some uh, communicative skills, right? So we, I mean, the final goal of learning a language is being able to communicate efficiently. So obviously the structure and providers, I mean, the format in which MOOCs can be built uh, do not really foster, right? It is this, uh, this communication. So this had, um, this has been a lot of, I mean, uh, this has had a lot of interest since 2013 that uh, applied linguistics started researching this. And, you know, when I started writing my, my thesis, <coughs> sorry, I had the chance to, 
and before writing my thesis, um, I had a chance to work uh, in a language MOOC, so in the design, so before the running of the MOOC and also during the MOOC. So you know that in uh, in MOOC, in the MOOC format, all the, the instructors have many, many different roles. So we need to deal with technology. We are content creators. We are also, um, you know, curators. We are facilitators. So I had a chance to work professionally uh, before and during the, um, the the MOOCs, but I was missing this final part that is when a MOOC finishes and you do the research, right? So this is where I started writing my my thesis, and uh, obviously um, this uh, this previous experience was very uh, was very important because for me writing the thesis has has been something like very natural, right? Because of this uh, professional background, so. Um, so this academic and professional background uh, permitted me to reach a deeper understanding of the of this subfield because this is a, a subfield within computer assisted language learning, a consolidated one. And also I had a chance to detect some existing gaps that required from researchers' attention. And when I say existing gaps, I'm talking about I mean I'm not talking about new concepts. Concept. Sorry, I'm talking about participation. I'm talking about the application of um, uh, learn, uh, effective learning theories in the format and how this participation and learning theories needed to be needed to be uh, um, considered right for efficient instructional design. So so far, I mean, uh, until you know, I started writing the thesis. These topics were something that were recurrent in research, but. Uh, all the evidence was kind of disconnected. So this work aimed to go a bit farther and provide a plural perspective, looking at the reference topics in the field, but also providing significant connections across these interest areas. So when, uh, I mean, the rationale behind uh, this work uh, takes a starting point in something that was proposed back in 2004 and 14 by Paul Pert and consisted in having a Kaleidoscope view. So, looking at different elements at the same time for a greater understanding of the phenomenon. So, uh, how could we do this rigorously, right? So, obviously, taking theoretical posits, so looking at theoretical backgrounds and also looking at, theory, at uh, research trends. And uh, then all this acquired knowledge should be applied in a practical way. So, we needed to experiment with the format accordingly and we needed to explore the elements uh, conforming a language book. And I have to say something that, that I think that this plural perspective and all these connections that I uh, I was able to 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 reach is uh, have been partly possible because uh, the selection of the modality of published papers, because uh, you know uh, even this subfield is not emerging anymore, but it's still novel. So I consider essential during my writing process to have this external validation, right? So obviously my supervisor was great and she has written a lot about the topic, but uh, you know, writing the thesis is such a long process that if you send something to a journal and gets published, also it's very motivating and uh, you know, it, you have the confirmation that the steps taken were correct and meaningful and you could move, you could move forward. So I will share now, oof, Sorry, this is not the slide. Okay, this is the one. So um, the main aim of my of my thesis was to provide a plural perspective of language MOOCs based on theoretical foundations and its practical application, looking at relevant elements and their connections. And uh, the hypothesis raised was that the study of diverse and unified elements in language MOOCs was leading to a multidimensional, a multidimensional and comprehensive understanding of the field, which at the same time was leading to the proposal of practical and replicable solutions to the issues addressed and the identification of new variables to consider in language MOOC research. So I would like to share, yeah, I mean, uh, some, um, something of the literature review I, I made, obviously uh, when I started writing, uh, what we, we, we had the first systematic review, that uh, you know, you have here a taxonomy that has been used before in MOOCs to identify the most outstanding topics in research, and the, the one in blue is the first one that covers from two thousand and thirteen and two thousand and eighteen. And I wanted to to I, I wanted you to see the comparison with the second one that was my first publication. It's a second systematic review covering 
from 2018, sorry, not from 2019 to 2021. And, you know, we use the same methodology. So we look at the same, at the same topics. And if you see the graph, uh, you can see two peaks. I mean, one is uh, in conceptual papers, right? Um, mostly focused on the instructional design. And also we have uh, another peak in participation. And well, this has been an historical issue uh, in MOOC, so that was not uh, something really uh, new, let's say. And um, also, if even I mean, even though it drops in relation to the former um, systematic review, we can see also educational theory. So what we could um, ascertain in the first systematic review is that you know uh, we had evolved from more um, um, more. Um, uh, practical sites or more conceptual, more theoretical. And uh, one of the main things about this first systematic review is that we assumed uh, that social le uh, language learning theory was the most outstanding learning theory for this format, was the most effective one. So that's why I think uh, it drops a bit. But anyway, I I I wanted to take, I, we, we didn't want to take this for granted, actually, because, you know, social language learning theory is quite broad, and we still needed to refine this for, for the MOOC format, right? So, uh, basically, I can say that these three main, um, main topics that were identified in the systematic review were the ones that um, I selected to design the subsequent research included. Right, so conceptuality focused on instructional design, participation, and also uh, ways to experiment with social language learning in um, in language books. So I will just uh, explain the objectives. <laughs> Sorry. The first uh, objective, well, as 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 you as uh, I have mentioned before, I mean it's this publication coming of age of language book research, uh, research a systematic review. So I we wanted to ascertain. Um, the state of the art on language MOOC research by a systematic review. And as I was saying, this served as a base for designing all the research that came after that. Then uh, um, we, I have the second publication where I can include objectives two and three. This is fostering social language learning in MOOCs, the role of discussion forums and social media. So the first thing that um, we wanted to do here was to develop customized functionalities in a language MOOC to foster social uh, language learning. So basically, you know that MOOCs are quite constrained. I mean, we, we have like uh, fixed resources and uh, what we needed to do is to foster interaction, right, for participants. So what we did here was to reinforce um, facilitation in the forums and also to use two different social media, that was Instagram and Facebook, for people to have more chance to interact. And then when we designed it, we assessed the impact of this educational intervention uh, in terms of fostering interaction and also to see how uh, this implementation improved the learning experience of, um, of participants. And, uh, you know, this uh, third um, paper was published in Spanish, but it's basically about participant profiles in language MOOCs. So, um, looking at behaviors, right? How, how different behaviors of participants was reported in the literature. And um, I have to say that here we can see, I mean, the results that I will explain later um, um, will really help, I mean, were determinant to design the, the, the last of the papers, right? Because we know, I mean, it was on the air that obviously participants um, are mostly passive, right? But we didn't have like a, um, evidence, I mean, gather evidence about this. So this is the first time we do that. And these also help us to design um, communication spaces in the, in, the last, in the last paper included. And yeah, in the, in the last paper, that is that the significance of instructional design, analysis of content in language MOOC forum, here, what I did is looking at uh, an instructional design. So the first thing that uh, was um, the first objective was basically propose an efficient methodological design to monitor the quality in the design of language MOOC forums, right? So obviously considering what we knew to date from participants that I will explain later. And also we wanted to test these designs Right, so we analyze the content of uh, uh, forum contributions to 
be able to determine if the pragmatic na nature, I mean, the, the communicative intention that were um, uh, on these uh, contributions that uh, participants reflected in the in the forums were coherent with the structure threats, right? That uh, had a specific structure according to what we knew um, about uh, participants' needs. <coughs> Sorry. So, well, um, another important thing uh, that I think it's it's very valuable uh, in this case for the thesis is that I had the chance to uh, to train myself in different methodologies. When you normally do a thesis, you just select one methodology and you apply different techniques. But in this case, obviously this was different because it implied for different publications. And this can be, I mean, and it it is it also has to do with the plural perspective that uh, was same. So we needed to find appropriate ways to approach each of the elements under under study, and this is why we can see four different methodologies apply. So I will just explain some basic notions of each of them, as well as the convenience of their selection according to the specific objectives addressed. <clears throat> well, uh, this is, I'm not. Um, giving too much detail on this. The only thing is that, you know, there was a systematic review that obviously we determine uh, with the limits of problem and we make a comprehensive uh, um, systematically review to present results, right? So in this case, what I can say, the most outstanding thing is that obviously this is a very strict protocol. So where you need to determine the criteria, you need to, uh, describe the rational, et cetera. And I mean, uh, the thing is that following all these um, strict protocols of systematic review, you make sure that obviously the inferences that you are making on uh, what you have analyzed are evidence-based. So this is um, basically, you can make sure that all your findings are quite relevant, right? So in this case, as I was saying before, this serves as a basis for designing all the subsequent research. And we have uh, this uh, in second, second publication, I use the design-based research. This is basically, I, I enjoyed a lot, um, I mean, doing this because um, design-based research aims to develop solutions to complex educational problems. But at the same time, you need to, um, I mean, in base of these results, you need to um, you need to improve the prince or refine the principles or theoretical assumptions that are, are underlying subjacent learning theories. So obviously we had some educational issues that in this case were, were um, you know, the limitations of the platforms for uh, communication. We designed an intervention, an intervention, we evaluated the design, and at the same time we contributed to refine this uh, learning theory in this case for this format. It was quite easy in this case because uh, it's been said that um, computer assisted language learning in which language MOOCs are framed have historical uh, indicators for intervention. And one of the main issues here is, yeah, how are we going to, how are we fostering communication if the platforms do not allow uh, this communication, right? So this was the starting point for this. And uh, the final outcome of this was that, yeah, I mean, based on this experience, what we learned is that we can do specific things to improve this interaction. And also we are kind of refining with these proposals, uh, this learning theory, but in the MOOC format. And well, in the case of the third publication, uh, as I was saying, this was a bibliographic review. This is not, I mean, uh, Basically, the inferences that you can take from here are uh, are based on the writers or researchers interpretation. Okay, and this is because there there is a non-standardized methodological process. I mean, you don't have to set up these exclusion inclusion criteria or so much clear objectives. And I have to say that for them, because of the final uh, aim of this publication, that was having this general overview of participants' behavioral profiles, that was really good because I was actually, all the information that I was trying to, uh, trying to collect, to analyze, it was presented in many, many different ways. So for me to set up these criteria would have been impossible. Um, and also all this information that I was trying to analyze was presented in many, many different ways. So basically I took two different taxonomies about participants' behaviors in MOOC. 
that were in the literature and I cross uh, the different categories for explaining uh, the data that I encountered uh, in, my, in, my, in my analysis. So as I was saying, this was quite convenient because um, I didn't know what I was uh, gonna find in the literature. And then I got this general overview of participants' behavioral profiles, that it was something that, as I was saying before, it was on the, on the air, but for the first time we have the evidence that all the research on language MOOC about uh, that was reporting some kind of this data was saying the same. And uh, well, uh, finally, in the last publication, you know, uh, the methodology is the analysis of content that uh, aims to build on procedures to make valid inferences from the text. I have to say that uh, the, um, the instruments that are used for this methodology are very different. In in this case, uh, you know, the most important thing is to justify the selection of the units of 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 the analysis. And um, the reason why I selected this uh, this methodology is it was because I wanted to monitor the quality of communication forums and you know the data that we had was the contributions to the forums uh, from participants. So we needed to categorize this information in pragmatic uh, speech acts or um, intentions, right? That um, that uh, participants had, and then to try to check if they were coherent with the structure threats, right? So we needed also to present valid inferences from contribution for analysis. So um, I think that the most important thing here was that uh, basically we could make this contrast and by the application of this methodology, we could make sure that these were once again valid inference, right? From, from the text that was analyzed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and what the main conclusions reads is that, you know, in the first uh, in the systematic review, what we what we can what we can conclude is that language MOOC research was now a kind of a mature subdiscipline within computer assisted language learning, not just because this transition from practice to conceptuality or to theory, but also because we were seeing like more sophisticated research. I mean, researchers were using mixed methodologies where, um, you know, you get quantitative, qualitative data. So, I mean, the perspective is uh, broader and it's more enriching. So yeah, that was this, this maturity. <laughs> In, um, the, main, the main conclusion of the second publication when we try to use social media and reinforcement in the forums, we have to say that we we had no very positive results on the on the um, on the role of facilitators of the reinforced uh, facilitation. So we didn't see like a significant increasement of interactions. But instead, we can just basically propose based on our data that social media is something that we need to try in in language MOOCs because. Um, I just remember one of the comments of participants that it was completely purposeful, meaningful, etc. So I think, yeah, I mean, um, it would be convenient to try to try this. Also, obviously, you need to learn also from um, from what uh, what it's a failure in the, in, the, in this case. I mean, we we need to face that, for example, social media. I mean, people are not used to use social media in educational context, so that's like a limitation. And um, and also, I mean, many people don't use social media in general. But anyway, um, we think that it's a promising avenue to um, for inquiry, right? And try to use in this social media. And uh, well, in in the case of publication number three, what we can what we can see is that I mean we ascertain that participants were like passive participants. I mean, and we are mostly focused on active participation, but most of the participants are, pa are passive ones, and this is something that it's in uh, MOOCs nature. Let, let's say I mean. We have massive participation and most of the participants don't interact uh, just download the resources and do not make any other thing so we need to uh, also to design for them right because this is the majority of the learners in in MOOCs and obviously there's some kind of criticism on the um, on the MOOC format about you know because basically we measure success based on completion uh, completion rates and i mean that uh, someone has done all the activities that were planned and obviously we need to change this perspective uh, we cannot measure 
language MOOC success based on these indicators. And uh, obviously, we need to start thinking about designing for the most um, for the most of the people that participate in a in a language MOOC. And the last the last conclusion about publication uh, number four is that um, obviously when we designed a call, I mean when we designed considering uh, participants' needs that. Basically, we took uh, how adults learn. So we provided um, spaces for self-reflection. Then um, we designed the forums to be clear, to have specific objectives, uh, to be easy to access, et cetera. But when we have these, when we prove that these variables are relevant and we are kind of standardized these variables, we can start creating common analytical frameworks. And I will finish now with some main takeaways and I will go back to this idea of building common analytical frameworks because I think now that it's not my defense and anything, I think that's the most outstanding thing from my thesis, right? Um, okay, so um, I have to say that the first lesson learned during this thesis is that, I mean, as Cole Pirate said back in 2014, we need to keep this kaleidoscope view until it's normalized, because I think it's the only way that we don't leave any element behind. And it is a way to have as many variables as possible under control so we can design more efficiently and not just the courses, but also the research that we do after the courses. So we need to basically understand how these elements are connected, how they influence each other and how somehow they depend on each other. And the second lesson learned has to do with this construction of common analytical frameworks, because I think that this opens new ways of inquiry. Basically, language MOOC research now has a strong theoretical frameworks and in progress, strong methodological frameworks, but we are still lacking common grounds to look at different elements analytically. So one clear example of this, even it has a limited scope, is the definition of how to determine the quality of resources that has been included in the last publication that I explained. And I think that can be considered a first step. We know now that uh, which variables are influencing quality in these uh, spaces, thanks to inclusiveness, easiness of access, self-determination, promotion, et cetera. So my recommendation is that should, this should be applied to any process involving these courses, so to be applied transversely, and this just strengthens research. And obviously it's easier to, uh, to do things without having to start from scratch all over again. And well, the last thing is that, I mean, my my suggestion or what I learned is that we need to design for future. So designing the pave, as designing to pave the way to future research, because it's not just about validating or refuting hypotheses in research, but when possible to propose applicable solution, so solutions building on the positives and learning from the failures. So, uh, to put forward designs or frameworks that could potentially be used in future research. And in here, I would just say that uh, the exploratory and experimental research that was included in my thesis uh, was basically doing that, was just, okay, so we have failed on this, we have learned this, but at the same time, we are proposing uh, <coughs> different alternatives. I mean, we, we are proposing now like a framework that can be just repli replicated, right, for future research and designs. And that would be it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just a quick introduction and thank you for the opportunity to present to GoGN. Um, I graduated from Athabasca's distance ed program uh, over the summer, and uh, I'm now a, a historian of open distance and flexible education. I teach history and uh, education courses at Northern Michigan University in the States. All right, my dissertation was a comparative study of the political, social, and economic origins of eight open universities in Canada and the United States. In the process of that research, I uncovered what seems to be a mostly forgotten history of the early years of the United Kingdom Open University's efforts to expand into the States during the 1970s. And I'm happy to share with you a glimpse into that story. Established in 1969, with a core ethos and mission to be open to people, places, methods, and ideas, the OU opened up formal higher education for British non-traditional learners as the institution implemented lessons learned from Charles Wedemeyer, who was the first Kellogg Fellow at Oxford University in 1965. Before then, at the University of Wisconsin, 
he pioneered an industrial course team approach on a small scale and proposed the articulated instructional media strategy, which suggested that the selection of print and media materials must be customized to the content. The OEU drew on his work by institutionalizing the course team approach with high quality correspondence packages, widely acclaimed BBC production media, and tutorial sessions. In doing so, the OU forged a new path as a model for the subsequent global proliferation of open universities. Early in their endeavors, the OU tried to break into the American market. After all, the OU needed alternative revenue streams after the conservative government cut funding in 1970. The States was the largest market and a logical choice given some cultural, political, and economic similarities. From 1969 to 73, OU officials Sir Walter Perry and Sir Peter Van Abels visited the States and Canada several times, attending conferences and scoping out the market. When an internal proposal for an international commercial entity failed to garner institutional support in 1972, the OU instead sought American partners to trial course packages. The American College Board President described the OU as the best effort yet known to harness the potential of radio and television and wed them to a system of independent study on a national level and wanted to bring the system to the states. The College Board, along with its assessment spin-off, educational testing services, and with funding from the Carnegie Corporation, coordinated a pilot during the fall of 1972 to assess the viability of OU courses. The four institutions shown here opted for the pilot, but Cal State withdrew. Generally, the pilot was successful at the other three. And I have the most information about the University of Maryland University College, UMUC. Um, so let's zoom in on that. The partnership moved quickly from idea to operation. UMUC established their Open University of Maryland, or OUM, program in a frenzy when they appointed Betty Jo Majewski as the director, and she embarked on a crash publicity campaign during the summer of 1972. The marketing targeted a variety of students, including individuals with disabilities, people working from home, and senior citizens. OUM initially ordered course materials for an anticipated enrollment of 100 students in the Humanities Foundation course, but expectations tripled. OUM staff determined they could handle 300 students, but they actually allowed four additional students to enroll because they were spouses who could share course materials. Just a few days before courses began in September of 72, OUM finally received the remaining 200 sets of course materials, which were delayed by a dock worker strike in Southampton, England. This illustrates how political and socioeconomic events beyond a university's control in another country threatened uh, implementation of a new transatlantic partnership. OUM split the 18 credits into three 12 week sessions of six credits per term from September 18, 1972 until June 26 of 1973. They did that to accommodate student finances and facilitate transfer credits. Course materials consisted of traditional books, student workbooks, and media used during optional tutorial sessions. But advisors encouraged students to take advantage of the interaction with tutors and their peers to avoid the isolation and low completion rates of entirely independent study. Seven tutors worked across 13 learning centers, 10 locations offered evening hours, and the other three had daytime hours, thus offering flexibility regarding time and place. And students could float to another center if they missed their weekly session. The tutors graded assignments and helped students translate British examples to the American context, often resulting in lively discussions. Like the OU, the pilot course required some residency for special lectures and unique events like a theater production. They had an additional weekend of activities before the final exam with more special lectures, a banquet, and a National Gallery of Art field trip. The demographics of the first cohort illustrate the characteristics of the non-traditional students that found this uh, independent study option appealing. 96% were non-traditional learners. 
60% had prior college credits and were looking to complete, not start, their degrees. Housewives comprised 38% of the first cohort and 18% identified as racial minorities. Just over half were employed full time. 58% were categorized as white collar workers and only 4.5% identified themselves as blue collar workers. This was similar to the OU, which although they targeted the working class, attracted more middle-class students. It is unclear what percentage of the first OUM cohort were in the military, but given UMUC's close collaboration with the armed forces and that three learning centers were on military bases, it is likely that military personnel and their spouses constituted a fair share. The pilot was successful. Students identified that the learning center interaction was important. They found the courses time consuming, but also worth it, and indicated they were more interested and felt more prepared for higher education after the pilot. Students indicated that the printed materials were more useful than the films, which is not surprising considering the films were only available in the learning centers during the pilot. And the British orientation of the materials was only a problem with some audio tapes. Faculty attitudes changed with more positive views toward working with non-traditional modes of instruction, off-campus courses, and mature learners. They were positive about the learning centers, non-traditional students' abilities, and the course materials. They recommended spending more time preparing tutors and reassuring students during the first few weeks. They also suggested the course pace was too fast. Uh, so they recommended running it over 39 or 40 weeks. Educational television was a problem at OUM because there were not enough students in the pilot to justify even trying to broadcast the programs on local networks, which of course was worthwhile. Okay. Um, so instead, OUM dealt with projector, co projector costs and sharing equipment. After initial success, they continued the next year with modifications and additions. During the 74-75 academic year, OEM switched to two nine credit terms and added science, math, and social science foundation courses, as well as the Renaissance and Reformation course. During the 1970s, the OUM program did not offer an entire degree, but OUM uh, expanded overseas to the European division in 1977 and into the Asian division during the early 80s, and that was for the military deployed learners. By the 90s, the OUM courses remained popular among domestic and internationally deployed learners, and the program was renamed Open Learning. It then evolved into what we know today as the University of Maryland Global Campus. Now let's zoom back out to the North American office. So meanwhile, the OU's marketing division established a relationship with American publisher Harper & Row to initiate course package sales and help prevent shipping delays, such as those experienced by OUM. By 1973, open universities were planned in Massachusetts, Georgia, Florida, Hawaii, Wisconsin, California, Illinois, Ontario, Alberta, and British Columbia. Things were looking bright. Encouraged by conference trips, the pilots, and requests for more information coming into Harper and Row, the OU set up their North American office in Manhattan in January of 74 with Professor Michael Neal as the first director. Neal's goals included learning about the higher education landscape, establishing an academic presence for the OU, testing courses, and exploring a permanent consultancy service. He experienced numerous logistical obstacles attempting to open the office, including a most crucial check with necessary startup funds that went missing, a bank in New York refusing to accept Queen Elizabeth II as a reference to open an account, and problems obtaining a corporate credit card for a corporation that did not yet exist. But the office officially opened on January 21st, 1974 and Neil spent the next few months meeting with officials from the institutions shown on the screen, all of whose names were redacted on the documents. Neil described his experiences as filled with goodwill and opportunities for the OU. It is not clear why, but the office moved to DC in 1974 and then relocated back to New York City in 1977. 
financing was possibly a problem because Neil had cautioned in 1973 that current breaks on educational expenditure in the US may well stop any rapid development of the course package idea and suggested that partnerships must at least break even. Next, we will fast forward to zoom in on another pilot in New York. The State University of New York has, had established an independent study program in 1967. Students could take correspondence courses, but not complete an entire degree. SUNY also had their own University of the Air program that existed from 66 to 69. It offered high quality broadcast programs with accompanying workbooks, but students could not complete an entire degree that way either. In 1968, New York's educational leaders debated the merits of a SUNY without walls institution and hatched a plan to create a new innovative institution that would draw on the ISP and the air offerings and serve the state's non-traditional learners. However, they tabled any immediate action in 1968 due to statewide and nationwide campus riots that consumed politicians' discussion about higher education, amongst other things. If the national student protests had not interrupted the SUNY Without Walls talks, then such an institution could have come to fruition in New York the year before, or perhaps the same year as the OU, which was founded in 69. SUNY Empire State was officially created in 1971. Four members of the planning task force visited the OU a few months before it launched and re reported back to the SUNY Board of Trustees on December 16, 1970, that a similar non-elitist demand for higher education existed in New York. The task force applauded the OU's quality educational broadcasting programs and course materials, but counter argued that the OU did not go far enough in their commitment to openness because of the structured and a relatively closed system of delivery where all media applicable to instruction are balanced within a space time frame. The task force insisted on more flexibility and more openness where it would provide the resources both for structure, if necessary, and for individual creative learning, if desirable. So the student would decide how to learn according to their preferences via individualized learning contracts. Drawing on the OU's model, they created regional learning centers where students and faculty could meet for degree planning and tutoring. However, OU's Lord, Ch uh, Lord Perry later observed that when comparing the two institutions, the two programs were as different as chalk and cheese. The difference came down to a matter of degrees of openness and student-centeredness. Unlike the OU, the Empire State student would decide if, when, and how they utilize available course resources. And furthermore, Empire State would not require any residencies or mandated tutoring and rarely use classrooms. A few years after the initial pilot coordinated by the American College Board and Educational Testing Services, an unnamed representative from the OU's North American office met with SUNY officials at a conference in March of 1976 to discuss the feasibility of using OU course materials at Empire State. On February 9, 1977, Empire State's Vice President John Jacobson notified staff that OU's faculty member, Vincent Wirth, would be seconded for three months to adapt OU course materials. Wirth was set to arrive on March 6, 1977. Jacobson noted that the OU accepts the financial arrangement prepared by us, though Sir Walter Perry wishes us to know that they're doing so is a sign of the special affection they have for us, meaning that the two institutions shared similar commitments to openness and probably there was no profit involved, but the financial arrangement actually remains unclear. Initial field tests that concluded in May of 1977 showed positive results of the courses shown on the screen. Although some units of the courses needed modification and others were not suitable, all had units that could be used as is when put into individualized learning contracts. Students identified that they liked the materials, the British context did not interfere with learning, 
and uh, whole courses were too long, but could be adapted into shorter units. They requested specialized tutors to work with the course materials, and Empire State planned to conduct further testing the following fall. The evaluation also indicated the need to adapt courses to better fit patterns of American higher education. So a team with the help of Vincent Worth chunked the foundations in social sciences and the foundations in technology courses into three credit and four credit courses that were more appropriate for individualized learning contracts. Administrators saw the potential of adapting OU courses to revitalize the independent study program and upgrade the courses both academically and pedagogically. In an effort to offer enough independent study courses for students to complete an entire degree, the next field test of OU courses occurred during the fall of 77. The results were also positive and the adapted courses became mainstays of the ISP um, used by students nationally and internationally. Now let's zoom back out again. By 1977, when Perry was writing his book about the OU, 19 unnamed American institutions were using OU courses, and Michael Neal was back in the UK running a new unit called the OU Consultancy Service, designed to collaborate with higher education institutions in other countries. It officially lasted until March of 1980, but the OU has continued these pilot and collaboration services ever since. Exactly when? How and why the American office closed remains unclear, at least to me. But something like uh, something likely happened in between 77 and 80 to prompt the official closure. And then, as you know, as some of you know, um, the United States Open University briefly existed from 1998 to 2003 as a sister institution of the OU. But that's another story that is at least somewhat better known. Now that we've looked into the past, we will turn to the lessons learned that might apply to other contexts. The OU focused on academic presence rather than profit, meaning they emphasized sharing experience about processes, outcomes, and institutional structure to stimulate potential partnerships. The OU leadership seems to have at least initially understood that macro conditions would both constrain and present opportunities when attempting international partnerships, but also misjudged the reality um, as the 1970s unfolded in the States. Focusing on an academic presence, as wonderfully altruistic as it was, had limited success given the macro conditions. The economic downturn of the mid and later 1970s, combined with the rise of neoliberal political agendas that dominated into the 1980s constrained public funding for higher education, leaving little room for experimentation with purchasing course packages from the OU, even when recognizably cheaper than hiring new faculty, which in turn prompted a backlash from American faculty who fiercely sought to protect their profession. Furthermore, the course packages were expensive and the American sales fell short of projections. The high level of support to implement the courses was another financing obstacle. The OU assumed that a consultancy service sustained by additional fees could facilitate both commercial and academic needs in the states. But American institutions were unwilling to pay for such services. And furthermore, the British government, who could fund such a consultancy service, refused to do so in another country. The OU therefore seconded existing staff, as happened with Empire State, with hopes that the early American partners would eventually fund similar positions. Despite the limited early success, the OU seems to have misjudged the American higher education landscape. Distance education remained underfunded by many universities and suffered from a low reputation. Although capacity remained insufficient, even after the massive investment in new campuses during the 1960s, community colleges served the open access needs of many non-traditional learners. The OU does not appear to have targeted the community college market, which might have been a better fit. And understanding cultural biases was another factor, although minor compared to the economic lessons. American faculty 
arrogantly thought their courses were superior to anything created by foreigners. OU officials thought that British academic expectations were higher than American academic standards, and that OU course materials were simply too sophisticated for American students. Although the pilot students did not share those biases, and these types of misunderstandings could have been avoided via mutual collaboration and communication prior to rushing into the first pilots, as happened in 1972. I'd be remiss if I didn't seize the opportunity to point out that it was difficult for archivists to find these sources. And then I was con confronted with the incomplete information due to redacting policies and the scant avail availability of sources. You can help prevent these obstacles by advocating that your institution preserves its written historical record, as well as by encouraging oral history interviews and historical methodology skills at your institutions. And finally, I dream of a future where a global open access digital historical archive that facilitates more awareness of these types of lessons learned. So please contact me if you are interested in trying to bring this dream to a fruition, or if you have any suggestions for finding more sources about the early years of the OU's North American office. Thank you.